unkind in Oregon. And blind kids can be unkind, too. And Debbie and Diane were mentally challenged. Mm -hmm. And the kids at the school made fun of me for being their friend. And I said, you know, if you guys have a problem with it, then live with it. But they're my friends, and that's the way it's going to be. And when I saw them, I knew instantly who they were, but they were fine. There was nothing wrong with them anymore. And everybody vibrated at different speeds. Everybody had different brilliances or brightnesses. And everybody <laughs> vibrated is the only word I can think of to, to express it mm -hmm. at a different speed or rate. It's interesting. I'm, I'm sitting here. I'm wondering because, of course, there's another question of are, are there are there multiple lives and all of that because, uh, you know, the children appeared to you, I assume, at the age you knew them. No, no, they did not. Oh, OK. They were the best of every age. They were timeless. Oh, they were young. They were old. They were middle aged. They were. I I don't, but I knew who they were right, right away, but they, it's not like they were, but they were, I guess if you could say they were anything, they were adult, but they were the best of, you, you could, you could tell the, the childlike quality of their having been children and the wisdom of the very old, but they were in the prime of their existence. It was like everything was prime in that place. The weather was prime. The flowers, the birds, everything was just perfect. What do you think in terms of, uh, in terms of, as you're telling me this, was it in terms of quality that allowed you to individuate each of these people and say, oh, that was my grandmother and that was my grandfather and these were the kids from school? Because when you're talking to them as, as timeless essences, there has to be something in that essence that allows you to connect to say, oh, yeah, that was Mary Jo or whomever. They communicated with me mentally or telepathic, telepathically is the, the closest word that I can come to to describe it but we weren't allowed to touch each other because we were starting to and that was when Jesus got between all of it or among all of us and separated us and he held up his right hand and he goes no and he would not allow us to touch one another and there was a certain gate that I could not go toward because I knew that if I went to that gate I could not come back right and I assume if you were touched by one of them, you couldn't come back. I don't know, because in, it, it seems like a lot of people's instances are different. And in mine, we were not permitted to yeah. touch each other. So, so at, at the, the point, point that he raised his hand, said no, is this the time your journey started to reverse? No, not yet. That was, when, uh, that was at the very beginning. And then he showed me the life review and mm -hmm. uh, everything from my birth up until the car accident. And then he said that I must go back. When you saw that life review, and of course that's the kind of thing that frankly I think most of us fear, or we should, unless we're totally not humble, but what, was there anything that stood out that was really the aha moment? The whole thing. Oh. It was just, um, I mean, to be aware of everyone else's perception of the event was quite, I mean, it was, it was overwhelming. The emotions that I experienced were, were very overwhelming, especially in the situation with my grandmother. Sure. Sure, you betcha. All right, so you go, you go through all this. You get, the, you get the message in terms of you're, you're here to love and you're here to forgive. You're going to raise two children. Three. Three. Oh, sorry, three. And did, by the way, did, uh, did, were you told when you'd have them and the no. circumstances? No. But Just... I did have three. I, I have three living children, and then I lost three, oh. and uh, I was widowed. My name is now Blazon, incidentally. It's B-L-A-Z-O-N. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, it was very recent. It was October 20th, but um, God brought me the love of my life now, and I've, I have never known so much happiness in my entire life as I have found with my husband now, Robbie. That's wonderful. That, that's, a, that's a marvelous story. Now, was there anything in your NDE where you were told you will meet the love of your life? No. I was just told that I needed to come back and that my work was not finished. Mm. Well, I wonder what that's about. And I but your know. work is not finished. Now, other than the idea of, uh, of uh, loving and forgiving, were you, were you told of any other work you were specifically here to do? I mean, raising the children, clearly. Yes, and, and then, of course, I had the three children that, that I lost, and then, right. I had, and then I have seven stepchildren altogether, too. 
All right, so you've got a zip code, but other, you know, other than other than raising the herd, were you uh, were you uh, you know told that there was any other life purpose? I mean, believe me, raising the herd is enough. But curious. Not specifically, but it was. I was told that it was very important and that I needed to go back for it. And he said, "Let them know of this day and tell them that I am." And that was what I was commanded right. to do. Okay. All right, now, when you came back, I assume that that was an equally quick trip? It was awful. It was, mm. that was awful. And it was a reverse of, of my going there, but then the pain began, and then I was back in the body, and it was heavy and, and horrible, and, mm. and um, I was nauseated and in shock and um I, I was finally able to talk to someone about it, and I did confirm the things that I had heard about the blood on my left eardrum and all that, that all of that mm. did indeed take place. But back then, in 1973, people did not discuss clinical death like they do now. And uh, one nurse said, well, you must have hit your head a lot harder than people thought you did, and I didn't want to talk to her anymore. Right. But there were quite a few people that did believe me, and I did share my story with quite a few of them. And then um, my, when my, my daughter, Nicole, is now 31, but when she was like two and a half years old, three maybe, she had stomach flu, and I was up all night with her, and I was reading in a Braille Reader's Digest. I found a condensation of Raymond Moody's Life After Life, and I just burst into tears because then I realized that there were other people who had experienced what I have. And subsequently I came to learn that there was a deaf man who experienced total full-blown hearing in his clinical death and for the first time he had heard the spoken word that had to be the best confirmation you could have gotten yes yeah suddenly i'm not crazy i'm not alone i i can i can only imagine how how comforting that was oh my i can't put words to it. it 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 just it was amazing to find people and then i heard on the radio, I heard Kimberly Clark Sharp, who is the local uh, International Association of Near-Death Studies president in the Seattle area, and uh, she was on the radio, and uh, no, on television, I'm sorry, she was on television then, and uh, I called the telephone number and got hold of her, and then things started happening to where I was, I was interviewed by BBC and all kinds of other people about this situation, about the clinical death. Yeah. Now, since since this, and obviously all the apart from the uh, logistics of it, and is it real, was the ultimate message that that's what you were left with the uh, the idea of the uh, universal loving and forgiving. Has that caused your depression to lift? Oh my, yes. And then also the fact that heaven is real, that what I experienced is real, that we don't just end with death. That I know this, and people can say all what what they want about being delusions of a dying brain and all that, but as I said on Art Bell, what they don't realize is that they're focusing so much on the peel that they lose sight of the banana. And the, the peel is, of course, our physical body, and the banana is our whole essence, and it goes on. You betcha. You betcha. Vicki, what a great story. And and thank you for taking the time to uh, to share it with me. I uh, I think you know my feeling again is that when somebody can do things outside the body that's impossible for them to do within it, if it's not proof of quote unquote life after death, it's certainly proof of life apart from the physical body, and that alone is liberating. Yes. So uh, I appreciate you uh, sharing it. I hope we'll talk again sometime. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Likewise, and congratulations on the marriage. Thank you. All right, how nice. What a, what a happy ending that is, don't you think? Uh, we'll talk to Yolaine Stout next hour and the hour after that, and then we'll take your calls in the final hour. Yolaine, as I was uh, mentioning earlier, uh, president of IANDS, and quite a story herself as well.